Welcome to the Royal Air Force Museum in London. I'm standing in front of our Battle of Britain display. The Royal Air Force Museum in London is the only place in the world where you can see four fighter aircraft which actually participated in the Battle of Britain. So we've got four fighter aircraft behind me and I'm going to talk about two of them. Now of course the first one is the very famous Supermarine Spitfire, but I'm also going to talk about its opponent, the Messerschmitt 109. The Spitfire is an iconic aircraft. It is loved by the public now and it was already loved well, from the first moment it entered service. A large part had to do with the aesthetics of the aircraft. Extremely clean lines. Now if you look behind me you see those wings. They were extremely narrow but it also had a downside to it and that is the position of the guns. So every hole you see here holds a machine gun. And I'll talk later about why that was a problem. I'll also talk a little bit about the narrow landing gear, the enclosed cockpit, the camouflage color. Some things worked well on the Spitfires, other less so. So why don't we have a closer look? The thin wings of the Spitfire were great for speed, very aerodynamic, especially at high altitude. The problem was, however, that because the wings are so thin, there's not a lot of room inside. So they wanted to put machine guns in. So if you look behind me, you can see four holes. There's also four on the other side for a total of eight machine guns. But this one is really far away from the center of the aircraft. So all the guns had to be angled in a certain way to well hit the target in front but at what distance should they converge well early on they were as far away as a thousand yards now, pilots quickly said well that's simply too far we're not going to hit anything that way so they brought it back to 500 yards and then even 200 yards but a problem still remained any aircraft further away or closer you're simply not going to hit with all the guns we're going to see later with the German aircraft that they had a different solution, uh, a more ingenious and more effective way. The landing gear of the Spitfire was very narrow, as you can see behind me. Now that meant that it was quite tricky really for takeoff and landing, because with all this engine power, the aircraft constantly had a tendency to swing left or right. And the landing gear being so narrow meant that there was always a possibility that the aircraft could tumble over in either direction. Once in the air, however, it was a completely different story. Pilots absolutely loved flying the Spitfire. Many co compared it with, well, fitting on a glove. It just felt so comfortable and so natural. For a very large part, the reputation of the Spitfire comes from its wonderful flying characteristics. Almost as famous as the Spitfire was its engine, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Now, the Merlin was probably the finest Allied aero engine of the Second World War, but quite early on in the war, it still had some problems. It was equipped with a carburetor rather than a fuel injection system like the Germans had. Now, why was that important? Well, let me explain with my hands. If this is a Messerschmitt, this is a Spitfire. The Spitfire would be on the tail of the Messerschmitt, but what the pilot would do of the Messerschmitt was evade in a steep dive. The Spitfire tried to follow, while the problem was that the gravity kept the fuel up and it would disrupt the fuel into the engine. And the engine would cease. So a Spitfire pilot had no other choice but to go on his back and dive after the Messerschmitt inverted, even at low altitude. Now, Spitfire pilots tended to be quite young, and it's probably because of their youth that they dared to do something like that. The solution to this actually came from a female engineer called Beatrice Schilling. Now, there were not a lot of female engineers back then, so it was quite remarkable that she was able to solve this problem. And what she did was she created a little device which was put into the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, and that regulated the fuel. So a lot of Spitfire pilots were very, very grateful for her invention. When we look at the side of the Spitfire, we can see its typical camouflage colors. Now, a lot of the RAF aircraft had a similar camouflage scheme. So you can see the green and the brown, that is to camouflage against the fields below. 
but at the bottom you can actually see it has a dark egg green color and that is to have a camouflage for the skies in the back now you may think well skies they are not green are they well they experimented with this and they actually found out that this kind of a green color is very efficient for the gray skies which you usually have over this country um, interestingly they also experimented with other colors and they found out that at very high altitude the best color to paint a spitfire in was pink so there were even some spitfires which were completely pink now a beautiful camouflage but you can also see that it's actually disrupted in a few places so you have the RAF roundel here the typical uh, blue white and red but they found out that the camouflage actually disrupted the roundel and it wasn't visible enough so they took the quite peculiar decision to put a yellow circle around the roundel which in my opinion actually disrupted the whole idea of having a camouflage in the first place also what we see are these three letters here so they actually had a meaning so a two letter combination that signified the squadron in this case PR that was the code for 609 squadron and F that is the letter of the individual aircraft uh, they would have well first 12 aircraft but towards the end of the war uh, up to 26 aircraft and every aircraft had an individual letter behind me you can see the cockpit of the Spitfire like the rest of the Spitfire it was quite narrow and cramped however engineers came up with an ingenious solution to give a little bit more headroom so if you look over here you can actually see that the cockpit hood is bulged so a pilot could look left and right and obviously he also wanted to look backwards but that was quite difficult so they came up with a solution of their own they would take the rear view mirror of an automobile and put it inside the cockpit later on that became a standard piece of equipment on a Spitfire but with this early Spitfire here at the RAF Museum it's not there yet much bigger problem was that the cockpit hood in these early Spitfires didn't open when they should so a Spitfire pilot wanted to bail out of his aircraft only to find out that the cockpit hood wouldn't open The aircraft behind me is the iconic Messerschmitt 109, the main opponent of the RAF during the Second World War. Now, it is in a way very similar to the Spitfire. It was also quite a revolutionary aircraft. They're about the same size, also their performance is similar. But depending on opinion, the Messerschmitt 109 is a little bit more angular looking, more aggressive in a way. Now, it was in service a little bit before the Spitfire came into service in the mid 1930s and its designer Willy Messerschmitt wanted to have a fighter aircraft with the most powerful engine in the smallest airframe and you have a closer look at the Messerschmitt and you'll see that's exactly what he got the armament on the Messerschmitt 109 is very different from that on RAF fighter aircraft aircraft like the Spitfire had eight machine guns which sounds great, but as I explained earlier, they were not all that effective. Now, the Germans put a machine cannon in the wing, one here, one on the other side, plus two machine guns on top of the engine. Now, a machine cannon is very similar to a machine gun with one important difference. The bullets are a lot bigger, heavier, and they carry an explosive charge. Think of them as grenades. A Messerschmitt 109 could fire a thousand of these grenades per minute. So in that regard, the armament of the Messerschmitt 109 was far superior to that of the Spitfire. One unique thing about the Messerschmitt 109 are these leading edge slats. So they extend at low speed. This gave it more lift, very important uh, during takeoff and landing. But it also meant that at slow speed the Messerschmitt 109 was actually more maneuverable than the Spitfire like the Spitfire the Messerschmitt 109 has a narrow landing gear however you may notice that the wheel struts are actually in an angle 
which was an attempt to make the landing gear wider. However, it meant that the wheels were not vertically down, which often made it more difficult for the takeoff and landing. Often said that the Germans lost more Messerschmitts in takeoff and landing accidents than in real combat. Now that is definitely not true. However, like the Spitfire, it was quite difficult to control such a powerful aircraft on the ground. But once in the air, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. The camouflage of the Messerschmitt 109 is in many ways similar to that of the Spitfire. Sure, the colors are a little bit different, but it was very effective. Dark on the top, light colors at the bottom. However, like the Spitfire, camouflage efforts were completely ruined by certain decisions to make it more visible. In this case, when you look at the engine compartment holding that fuel-injected Daimler Benz engine, it's completely covered in yellow paint. This was to be able to recognize each other in combat so they wouldn't have friendly fire accidents. But obviously that meant that these Messerschmitts were very visible also to the RAF fighters. The cockpit hood of the 109 is different from that of the Spitfire. While the Spitfire had a bulged cockpit hood which gave it a little bit more room, no such luxury existed for the German pilot. He was really in a very tight spot. Plus, the many frames of the cockpit meant that the visibility was a lot less. Now the final question, which of these is the best? This is a question that we get a lot. And I wish I could give you a simple answer, but unfortunately it's not that easy. So speed is quite similar, both of them very fast aircraft. The Messerschmitt was a little bit faster at high altitude, but then again, the Spitfire was more maneuverable, except at low speed. Then those leading edge slats of the Messerschmitt made it a little bit more agile. Then because the Spitfire has wider wings, it meant that it couldn't roll as fast as the Messerschmitt. The armament on the other hand, well, that, the, the Messerschmitt was a clear winner. In the end, the difference was so small that it depended on the quality of the pilot. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, or better yet, come and visit us at the Royal Air Force Museum in London.